this is our final session and uh, we will have uh, one final Q&A uh, with uh, everyone here. Uh, but before we do that, uh, this next talk will be uh, done by Ajahn Brahmali. Uh, it is about the future of Buddhism and how we can safeguard it. Uh, this is of particular concern to many, especially in uh, Southeast Asia where there are many influences swaying the young. Uh, Ajahn Brahmali, of course, uh, many of you know him already, but he was born in uh, Norway in 1964 and he first became interested in Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s after a visit to Japan. Uh, he talks make the teachings of the Buddha accessible to everyone and they're extremely popular downloads uh, from the Buddha Society of WA website. So make sure you check out the website and you can download those talks. But I'd like to welcome Ajahn Brahmali. Okay, thank you so much. Is that working properly? Can you all hear me? Pick it up. How's that? Okay. So it is, it is slightly embarrassing to talk about the future of Buddhism, and the reason for that is that I've been doing this study uh, with Ajahn Sujato before we tried to map the past of Buddhism, and we couldn't even map the past, now we're going to talk about the future. So, you, <laughs> so it's slightly problematic. But still, what is, what is interesting about this uh, is that although it is problematic and it's difficult to talk about specifics of the future, uh, the Buddha himself actually talked about the future of Buddhism. And I, one of the things that I always like to do is to go back to the suttas, uh, to look back at the word of the Buddha. I'm going to base this talk essentially uh, on what the Buddha said and how he uh, suggested that we should approach uh, at the present moment so that we can safeguard also the future. Uh, and one of the things that I think comes out of a conference like this, which I find is very interesting and very exciting, uh, is based on a simple idea that so many of the Buddha's teachings uh, here we have been talking about mindfulness, uh, but also other aspects of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, they are so powerful uh, that they can be used in society pretty much at any time. Uh, here we have seen the use of uh, mindfulness in its application to psychology. Uh, uh, people who have depression, all kinds of problems. Uh, uh, that is one way that Buddhism can be, uh, Buddhist teachings can be used. Uh, there are other ways, and I think one of the things that has not been spoken about here basically because the theme wasn't about that, uh, and that is Buddhist ethics. Uh, Buddhist ethics, again, is very, Buddhist ethics are very profound, uh, they're very practical, uh, they're very realistic, uh, there's something very special about that, and if you find it's one of the things that I did with uh, Adan Sudato before was the idea of uh, karma and rebirth in early Buddhism, and that includes Buddhist ethics. Uh, and when you start to look at Buddhist ethics, you can see how it can apply uh, to all our contemporary uh, ethical dilemmas, and that will also be true in the future if we apply uh, Buddhism in the, in the right way. And it was very interesting to uh, hear the talks yesterday by uh, Damit Herat. Are you here, Damit? Where are you? Here? Uh, he's here on stage. Wow, of course. I should have known that. He's just behind me here. Very interesting to listen to these talks, both by Damit uh, and also by some of these other people look peering into the future, uh, into the... Um, uh, into the famous glass bulb and seeing what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and I, I, straight away, when I was listening to that, I thought, this is an area that Buddhist ethics can actually be used and applied to these things. Uh, and it's not that difficult even uh, to apply Buddhist ethics to these evolving and coming areas in the future. Uh, I was thinking specifically about Dhammit's idea of robots and arti artificial intelligence in the future. Uh, what happens uh, if a robot becomes conscious, right? Very interesting idea. Is it possible, from a Buddhist point of view, that robots become conscious? And the answer is, I think, theoretically, yes, it is possible. It's just an aspect of dependent arising, and there's no reason why consciousness should not be able to arise in some kind of other body than just the ordinary physical body of human beings. So what would that mean? What does it mean if, if consciousness arises in a physical body? And what it means, of course, is that the body or this robot doesn't just have consciousness, uh, but the robot also would have feelings, perceptions, volitions, uh, because all of these things arise from a Buddhist point of view together with consciousness. Uh, so uh, um, a Dhammit's robot would have feelings, right? Uh, so you would, you know, you, <laughs> and that is problematic, of course, if you like to have a robot and you want to use a robot for practical things in ordinary life. You couldn't turn it off anymore. Don't turn me off. I don't want to. I want to go on living. I'm alive. I can feel. I have this baba tanaha, the craving for existence, just like anybody else. And if you tell the robot, I think one of the 
uh, great usages for robots, uh, particularly these days, and probably coming more in the future as well. Uh, this idea of having the robot do housework for you, right? All the boring stuff, the vacuuming, cleaning the dishes, and all this kind of thing. So, but the robot isn't going to comply. It's going to say it's boring. I don't want to do dishes. I don't want to do the vacuuming. <laughs> Right, it, causes, it creates all kinds of problems. If you have a conscious robot, it creates incredible problems. So, so I would recommend, Amit, if you can keep consciousness out of the equation, much, much better for you. So try to keep the consciousness out, and then you might have a useful robot for the future. Anyway, I'm just saying that once the robot becomes conscious, you have to treat the robot essentially like we treat human beings, like we treat animals. There's no distinction anymore at that point. And I don't think that's what we want the robots to do. So, and of course, so that is another area of Buddhism is very powerful, has a powerful uh, teaching on ethics. Uh, it also has a very powerful teaching on the spiritual life, right? The overcoming of suffering, uh, the movement towards happiness. Uh, and I think this, of course, is the most powerful thing of all with Buddhism, uh, to have a realistic teaching uh, which drives you away from the problems of the world towards a more profound happiness. Uh, and this is this kind of thing which gives all of us a sense of meaning in life, uh, a sense of purpose, uh, that we're all heading towards something great, or something more, uh, something more powerful. Uh. So because the Buddha's teachings are so powerful and so important and useful, uh, it is important uh, that we safeguard this potential also for the future. So also future generations will be able to make use of these teachings in the, whatever contemporary society arises at the time. Uh. Um, Okay, I have no idea how the time is going, but anyway, we, <laughs> we shall find out down here. So, uh, and so it is so important that we safeguard these things. Uh, and of course, the way that we safeguard these things ultimately, and this is quite, of course, the important point, uh, is that we have to, we uh, basically, all of, we have to understand where all these teachings come from uh, and where they really come from is from the awakening experience. Uh, from the enlightenment of the Buddha himself. That is where these teachings come from. So to be able to uh, uh, push this into the future as well, we're going to have to understand what this enlightenment experience is about. So one of the important ways of being able to safeguard this into the future is of course then to go to the teaching of this person that we know as the awakened one. That's what the Buddha means, the awakened one two and a half thousand years ago. And this is one of the projects that somebody like Ajahn Sudato has been championing for many years. And I'm not really a leader, I'm kind of a follower. He kind of champions stuff. I think, yeah, that makes good sense. And I kind of follow along. But it's wonderful to have people who have that, who actually have understood this, that this is the essence of the Buddhist teaching. This is where it all comes from. We need to go back to the source. And that is the teachings of the Buddha himself. And very powerful and wonderful that uh, Ajahn Sudato is doing things like Sutta Central. Sutta Central is giving us a tool to actually access those original teachings uh, in multiple languages, not just in Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, etc., but also in all of our contemporary languages around the world. It's a wonderful thing here. And why is it so important? Well, one of the reasons why it is so important, again, is that we have to go back uh, to the Buddha himself. Uh, and what does the Buddha say about how to safeguard the teachings into the future. And what he says is that, first of all, he says, I'm not going to appoint a successor. I'm not going to appoint somebody to come after me. The future, what will be your teacher, is this Dhamma that I have taught you. That should be your teacher, right? Very important. That Dhamma I have taught you, that is your teacher for the future. The second thing that he says, it says that in the future, there will be people who do not listen to the teachings of the Tathagata, the teachings of the Buddha, which are profound, that are deep, that are connected with emptiness. And instead, they will be reading all kinds of other teachings, including teachings of disciples. So who are the teachings of disciples? Well, those are the Buddhist teachings of anybody except the Buddha. Those are the teachings of the disciple. So what the Buddha himself is saying, that we should always try, if at all possible, to move back to the original teaching, the basic source of wisdom from which everything else arises in the Buddhist world. And it's very fascinating when I go around the world and I, I travel actually a fair bit these days to get invited to all these places, which of course is very nice uh, and sometimes a bit tiring, but very nice. 
But what I find whenever you go somewhere and you ask somebody, who is your teacher? What do people say? And what people say is, oh, Ajahn such and such, Sayado such and such, Bante such and such, that is my teacher. How many people do you see who actually say the Buddha is my teacher? There is almost nobody saying that. And because of that, there's a vast amount of work to be done in making people understand that the basic foundation of Buddhism are the early suttas and the teachings of the Buddha himself. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't listen to anybody else. Of course you should. Otherwise, I would be a hypocrite even standing here. <laughs> You have to, but remember that the gold standard, the foundation, is always the teachings of the Buddha himself. This is so important. And it did actually occur to me when I, I was listening to some of the talks here. I was listening to the talk by uh, Dr. George Burns. I, are you still here? Uh, George Burns? No, he's disappeared. Uh, and some of the others, and I noticed how they were quoting the word of the Buddha. That was a nice quote. All the quotes were very beautiful and nice. And then he said at the bottom, the Buddha. Right? But they weren't from the Buddha. That was the interesting thing, right? <laughs> you had all these quotes that purport purported to be from the Buddha, but actually they were not from the Buddha. And this shows you the confusion in our world of what actually are the teachings of the Buddha and what are not. And there is a whole website, uh, if you go onto your, uh, Google tonight and you log onto the web, there's a whole website called False or Fake, I think it's Fake Buddha Quotes. Uh, and it has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fake Buddha quotes. Uh, and it shows you why the history of these quotes and why they actually are fake. Yeah. So it is a massive problem in our world uh, to actually understand the early teachings. Uh. So this is the first thing yeah, that we need to do. Ah, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a massive problem in our world. We have to, uh, this is still a work in progress and it's something that I hope we can do here. Uh, not here perhaps, but with the Buddha Society of WA, to continue move in the direction of early Buddhism. Lots of work to be done there. Huh? This is the first thing. The second thing that we need to continue doing as a Buddha Society, and again, uh, I uh, take this again from the suttas, uh, and one of the things that the Buddha said soon after his awakening, uh, he said to his monks at that time, there was only a small gathering, of course, uh, but he said to them, uh, Go out into the world and teach these teachings uh, for the happiness and the benefit of the masses, uh, right? Do not let two of you go in the same direction. Uh, that is what he said. Uh, and what that means, in a sense, is that Buddhism uh, is slightly a missionary religion, right? Uh, it's not a missionary religion in the same sense, perhaps, as other religions, uh, but it's a missionary religion in the sense that we have a beautiful message to spread into the world. Uh, we don't want to go out converting people, but we want to make that message available to people. So if they need something, something to help them overcome suffering, something to help them move towards happiness, uh, and this is the speciality of Buddhism, then the teachings are available. Uh, so let's continue that. Let's continue the wonderful pioneering work that the Buddhist Society of Western Australia did from the very beginning. We're starting an uh, internet site, a website uh, that's been made available for the whole world. Let's continue with that. Uh, let's not be afraid of putting resources into such a wonderful thing uh, that at the very least, uh, we don't go out missionizing, but we make the teachings, these wonderful teachings of Buddhism uh, available to the world, wherever people may be. Uh, and when you start to look at the statistics or downloads from the Buddha Society website, it's absolutely astonishing where people listen to these teachings, right? Places like Syria, places like, you know, really troubled places around the world. In the Middle East, people listen to these teachings. It really goes around the world in an absolutely astonishing fashion. So this is the second thing for the future. I'm coming, I'm kind of building up a little bit here. The third thing uh, that we should need to look at, uh, uh, two minutes. <laughs> the third thing that we need to look at, I'm going to say that very, very quickly and briefly, is that I hope, and this Ajahn Brahm was also touching on this before, uh, I hope we continue to be a Buddhist society or a Buddhist community that looks to the future and doesn't cling on to the past. Uh, takes leadership uh, in doing what is right, both according to the Buddhist teachings, uh, but also doing what is right uh, in accordance with what is necessary in contemporary society. Uh, and of course, the classic thing that we did, which I'm very 
proud of and I think was a wonderful thing to do was precisely the ordination of bhikkhunis a few years, a few years ago. It was a very, very right thing to do, both from the requirements of contemporary society, but also, of course, from an ethical point of view, according to the Buddhist teachings. And let us not stop with that. Let us continue to be innovative. Let us continue to ask what are the requirements, both from the suttas and for contemporary society, and not be afraid of innovation. Let us not become a large, stagnant, conservative organization, which is happy with kind of pending, pending its turf, defending its turf, because now we have become part of the establishment, so now we need to defend ourselves. Let's never get to that point. Instead, let's always remember why we got where we are, and that is by being innovative. It's by thinking towards the future, not grasping and holding on to the past. But all of these things, they fade in significance compared to the one thing that really matters the most of all. And that is the thing that I, I think all of us can understand this to some extent. And this is the one thing which I think really safeguards the message of Buddhism for the future. And that is those things that make awakening and deep meditation and deep insight possible. What, I, what is that one thing that makes it possible? That one thing which makes it possible is monks and nuns practicing in the monasteries that are located in the forest, far away from the distractions of the world, far away from the distractions of the pleasures of the world, to be able to still and attain a state of mind which is conducive to the profound insights of the Buddhist teachings. And what is so fascinating about it, I apologize for going a little bit over time, but uh, what is so fascinating about this is that I always felt that, I'm sure many of you can also intuitively feel that that must be true. Huh? You have to move away, you have to be able to steal yourself, you have to move out of your ordinary environment uh, and withdraw the mind from the ordinary pleasures of the world. Uh. But what really drove the point home to me here uh, is in the Maha Parinibbana Sutta, this is the last sutta, talks about the very last days of the Buddha's life. Uh, this is where the Buddha is laying down his legacy, he's teaching about the monks how to look after Buddhism for the future. Uh, and he says there are seven things uh, that will ensure the longevity uh, and the well-being of the Sangha and of Buddhism into the future. Uh, and lo and behold, I'm not going to talk about all the seven, but lo and behold, one of those is that the Sangha, the monastics, live in the forest. This is one of the conditions for the well-being of Buddhists in the future. So please, help support that. I'm not saying we shouldn't support other things, of course we should, but both as monastics and as lay supporters, please remember that. Let's, let's uh, take care of that forest tradition. Let's not overindulge about building uh, luxurious monasteries with large palaces for monks, uh, but let us support it enough uh, so it can have that existence whereby it fulfills its purpose of enlightenment, awakening, and deep meditation. And as long as we have that in the world, uh, as long as we have the profound understanding of Buddhism is still here, then we will be able to understand the suttas properly, properly uh, and we will be able to solve and resolve uh, the problems of contemporary society, and we will have a Buddhism that lasts for a long time into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahmali. We'll just try and do a bit more, bit more of a move around so we can get fit everybody in for this uh, next session of uh, question and answers. And uh, this one, again, will be moderated by Ajahn Brahm, so I'll pass it over to you. Okay, so now there's the opportunity to ask a question of anybody uh, who has been presenting over the last two days. And it's wonderful that you can get a question which is about everything we've been talking about over the last couple of days. So anyone who wishes to come to the microphone, please come up 
And please address only one question each, please. And please uh, tell me who you wish to answer the question. So the first gentleman uh, on the left here. Thank you. My question is to Dharma Ruvan. Um, from, if I understood it correctly, you talked about your past lives quite confidently. How do you know about them? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you pronounced my name really well. Dhamma <laughs> Ruan. <laughs> so, that's good. Uh, how do I know it? Um, it's somebody else also asked uh, the same question while you're having tea. It's just like for you to, for everybody to get an idea, it's just like uh, as if I met you two days ago, you know that you met me and you know that my name is Dhammaruan. Suppose that we met yes, day before yesterday, right? <coughs> that memory, the same memory, same way, you will know who your friends are, who you, you will know that what your name is. So that's the way you know it. Uh, but are you asking anything other than that? Or is that it? No, just how do you know that you had past lives? Yeah, so uh, when I was uh, a little boy, what happened was uh, I spontaneously chanted and after with that chanting, uh, not only chanting came up from that past life memory, but the meditation also came up. There's so many other things. There was uh, a meditation uh, methods that was practiced at that time. And uh, I was like a little, very little baby, but like a sage, old man. But when this is gone, I remain a child again. So like I have a session for like two hours where I talk about past life, where I'm very, very clear, uh, like an old man. And then after that, uh, I become a child and uh, play around, have a little child. So this went on like that. Uh, until uh, the child took over and the old man left. So the difference is between uh, others and me, everybody who explained, they came into the Dhamma with a lot of uh, uh, study and practice. But I started with from a high place and I went down. <laughs> so I went down so down I couldn't even remember anything. And I couldn't, uh, I was just average guy. And uh, all the average things that happens, you know, uh, happened to me. And then it was very, very difficult for me to bring myself back up again. So, uh, so I have like a curve like this, whereas you all have a steady climb. So that's a bit of a difference. So that's how I would say. Uh, thank you. So Ananda, please. Very, very quickly, because I, I must go, I've got the dogs at home. To the monk who spoke about the, the robot that doesn't do, like to do the vacuuming and wash the dishes, if you dispense with his or her services, would they be able to claim social security benefits? <laughs> social security benefits for robots? <laughs> So can robots claim social security <laughs> after they have been dismissed uh, under Ajahn Brahmali's uh, regime? <laughs> now that is a matter for Tony Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not on the panel. Ananda at the top there, thank you. Thank you Ajahn. Uh, I was going to raise this question yesterday, actually it was, I was going to direct it to Venerable Sinaishi. Uh, but uh, time ran out, so I might ask that question now. Uh, you gave a very clear uh, uh, account of your work with cancer patients and raised the question uh, how to sustain this. You said uh, uh, there was very good results, uh, very good results, but uh, uh, it was difficult to sustain. But uh, things 
came flooding back to my memory one of the retreats that I attended uh, under Ajahn Brahmali and one of the suttas that he inculcated in us at that time. This was probably about uh, uh, three years ago, Ajahn Brahmali, that uh, simile of the mountains uh, in the Kosala Sangyutta, which you a uh, number of times read that, the four great mountains rolling down and crushing down everything. And uh, what, what did you say? That this... Uh, uh, old age and death is rolling in. So uh, isn't it uh, better to uh, uh, start with, uh, uh, in addition to Anapanasati, uh, one of the uh, contemplations of the six contemplations, which is Maranusati, death contemplation. So we all the time uh, think of death. In fact, this morning at four o'clock, I woke up thinking, <laughs> Uh, that the four mountains are rolling in because last night I was talking about it when I went home. So uh, we are all potential cancer patients. So isn't it uh, better to use that death contemplation uh, in addition to mindfulness breathing? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, basically, I need to clarify. First, uh, this this uh, course was led by uh, my colleague, the co-author, um, doc, uh, Dr. He's not a doctor. He's a clinical therapy, psychotherapist. And uh, basically, the method include um, mindfulness of breathing, body scan, and also um, chitanopathy. So several also include yoga. So it's a kind of multiple method applied to cancer patients. And the most, in addition to this, I think the most important part is the record of uh, reflecting on the process and also group sharing. Group sharing inspires a lot of the cancer patient because cancer patient, uh, if she or he is, uh, think this is all by myself. I need to overcome all this difficulty by myself it became very difficult. But when there is a group of the uh, peers who are all got the same uh, problem and all spoke of the fear, the anxiety, uh, the worry, it became very powerful. It became kind of uh, support each other also. It's kind of recognize I am not alone. I can overcome this by others by learning from others so i think there are multiple factors influence the effectiveness of uh, mindfulness practice as we mentioned choosing friend good friend is very important yes. thank, thank you and what i meant was before it got to the cancer stage uh, start uh, teaching uh, death meditation. Thank you, that's what it is, but I can't let this go to the keeper. It's not the time to talk in cricket jargon, but uh, now I have got it. Uh, I must also say Ajahn Brahm will probably become the number one uh, convention organizer hereafter. What a fantastic uh, uh, convention, and uh, I have to uh, can't let this opportunity go without thanking the organizers, Buddhist Society and Ajahn Brahm, a fantastic uh, convention. And uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to attend. Thank you very much. And Ajahn Brahm says in his retreats, uh, if you are saying a sadhu, lift the roof. I just want to give three sadhus uh, the way Ajahn Brahm does the sadhus in his retreats. I want everyone to say three sadhus. This convention center must be having enough insurance. Let's try and see whether we can lift this roof. Sadhu! 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 Thank you. Very good. Uh, just a 30 second commercial, just to remind you about Venerable Zinai Shi's additional talk on Friday the 14th at Dhamma Loka. She will be elaborating on the same topic that uh, she gave and there were unfortunately some technical features. Hopefully on Friday there won't be any technical features, will be perfect. And uh, please attend, it's free at uh, 7, 7 to 7, 7.30 to 8, there will be a meditation she will lead and then 8 to 9, she will give a talk or the full presentation of what she was going to tell us here. So please well, please come and it's free. And it's at Dhamma Loka. If you don't know where it is, please ask anyone of us. Thank you.
Very good. Uh, we have the lady over on my left. Is it my turn? Thank you. It's um, Pat from Thailand. I try my best to hold back the last uh, two days uh, as um, maybe this question pertains to uh, the it's all their fault. I have tried my best uh, to deal with my own emotions and be mindful. And maybe this goes towards Venerable um, Robina uh, Kortin as well as Ajahn Brahm as the uh, Father um, Bob is not, not present here. Uh, my concern has to do with uh, the situation of um, um, my assignment that ended up at the State Department of the United States, uh, a new division, uh, not quite new, actually it's been there for about 10 years on religion and human right. Accidentally, I found myself, I thought this is to develop a Buddhist round table after they have developed the Hindu round table and the Muslim round table. And subsequent to that, there's been many issues that arose after the round tables came together. Um, some, uh, 15 years ago, I was there and I found myself the only immigrant uh, Buddhist there. There were five people, three gentlemen were subcontractors of the State Department and a lady, Michelle Bohannon. I know this is a risk to my own security. She was assigned Burma in terms of dealing with Buddhism. How does one try to follow, yes, uh, your kindness in saying, if they um, destroy the whatever uh, religion, just uh, flush it down the toilet, seek a plumber. It's very difficult for me to see that um, superpowers use religion and human rights as a ploy uh, to um, to cause more conflict and suffering. Uh, and I subsequent to seeing what occurred in Myanmar with the Rohingya and the radicalization of uh, Buddhist monastics, also in Sri Lanka versus the Hindu, and it took us 30 years to help settle that issue. How does one... Um, go about um, balancing, trying to support, um, protect. I know it does not need protection, um, you know, as a team, as a, um, you know, as a lay person, when one stumble across a very obvious group that, um, this same group, by the way, research all the Thai um, temples in the United States and Canada, and the ones that are researched the most have the most problem, you know. So uh, I'm very concerned about how does one uh, deal with it's all their fault. Yes, um, they have uh, strategies that could disrupt and cause so much suffering um, on many mothers who have lost their, you know, children and their sons. How does one go about uh, coping with this type of situation? You said something wrong. Okay, um, because uh, I know Sri Lanka, I know Thailand, and I know the former president very well, and I know the situation probably even better than, than you do uh, on the ground. And you know that, uh, yes, you don't blame people, but uh, that doesn't mean you don't um, do anything. The saying was that rather light a candle than complain about darkness, you actually go out there and do something. And there's many, many good Buddhist, Buddhist monks, ones that I know of, who actually are um, standing up against the Bodhibuddha Sena uh, in Sri Lanka, who stand against you know, people in Burma who oppose the Rohingyas. These are monks who are there on the ground actually doing something. And there's other monks, you know, especially on the internet, who also make sure that we keep the traditional Buddhist teachings, which we all share, no matter what type of Buddhism we have, you know, have compassion and fairness and respect for one another. That is especially what I meant. Don't flush those things down the toilet, because what other sometimes people do, they feel that you have hurt me, you have destroyed my monks, destroyed my temple. It's called provocation. 
And that provocation has led to the destruction of many, many religions. It drags Buddhism down to the level of violence and uh, blaming people. This is, please, never allow that to happen. Otherwise, we are allowing Buddhism to be flushed down the toilet. Very grateful. So when will we have the uh, global conference on interfaith resolving conflict with mindfulness beyond uh, just Buddhism? I have no idea about that one. But, <laughs> but the first point, I don't quite know the topic. I, I get the sense of what you're saying, and my feeling is this. I've heard that the Buddha said, if you can change something, please change it. But if you can't, it doesn't mean you give up. I mean, I just think the Dalai Lama is the most amazing example. There he is, 60 years later, still cracking jokes about the communists who are destroying his country. He has never given up for 60 years, never given up, diplomatically, socially, politically, religiously, trying to change things. So the part is we, because we are overwhelmed, because we have ego, we freak out if we can't change something. So we just don't give up, but we have to have a happy mind as well. So <laughs> the two wings of the bird, wisdom and compassion. Thank you. Anu Modhana, thank you so kindly. Very good. Um, Okay, we're we're going around in a circle. So this gentleman next. Hi. Uh, thank you for the the wonderful sessions. And I'm I'm Jun Ka, who come from the South Korea. Uh, actually, yesterday, actually yesterday in the opening speech, I have a question to the Ajahn Brahm, and you refer like with the the ordination of female, uh, female nun, and now uh, you refer the gay and lesbian right. Actually, for me, it was the first time I see the Buddhist officially support, I mean, like, refer the gay and lesbian right. So I just want to ask why do you support them as a Buddhist? And if it's possible, I just want to ask, like, this kind of social, like, involving is, is a, a how this can social involving improve our mindfulness? Like, is that question clear or? Certainly it is, and as it's addressed to me, uh, it is. Uh, as a core Buddhist principle, it's um, kindness without discrimination to all beings. And it's, to me it's an obvious, gay, lesbian, transgenders, they are all beings, living beings. And it's obvious we should be kind to them. And of course in the early Buddhist teachings there's no discrimination there. So it was such an obvious thing to me, and it was a surprise to me that there was such a thing as discrimination against gay and lesbians you know, in our Buddhist communities. And so, yeah, I'm very happy to stand up for those, and so are many other people in societies and in places, people who have majority Buddhist um, cultures, and I'm going to uh, criticize Singapore today, because in Singapore, the gay and lesbians are not given the respect and equality which they deserve. Mostly it's because of fear amongst the people. The old traditions, they're not good enough I mean, when they disrespect somebody. And I've gone out there and uh, I don't mind standing up and putting my reputation on the line. Uh, because you know, if you are a senior monk, if you have got some a lot of disciples, if you have got some authority, for goodness sake, use it. Because if somebody else stood up, they may get hammered. But, you know, I'm pretty hammered already. I'm pretty sort of worn <laughs> to being hammered. And so I've become almost unhammerable now. <laughs> so, yes, please let us all stand up for the gay and lesbian communities who are welcome. Okay, we have the question. Uh, which way is it going around? At the back, to my left, yeah. Sony here. Uh, my question is regarding severe, people who suffer severe depression. Now, we've heard about mindfulness, the different therapies, but I feel that this is more like an incremental approach, bit by bit, to cure the patient. Now, after hearing about hypnosis, why not use hypnosis as a big bang approach to actually cure people or suppress those who have experienced very traumatic um, passes, uh, past experiences or, or their lives. And Kong, was, oh, there you go, here we go. 
Yes, whenever we hear of a certain kind of therapy doing wonderful things, it's very natural for us to say, why not we use it more often? Well, it is. Um, I teach hypnosis. I'm a member of the Australian Society of Hypnosis. I think the simple answer is, again, there are many roads to Rome. For some people, hypnosis just doesn't work. We have to try something else. So very often, to me, the skill, the wisdom of a therapist is to actually know and understand the varieties of ways of being helped. So that whoever comes in through the door, our mind is open to the various ways of being helped, including mindfulness. Because the problem is, if you only got a hammer, everything is going to be a nail. <laughs> we need much more tools than just a hammer. So I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, yes, that over here. Francis Mary, nice to meet you. Thank you, Asian Brown. Um, I've written uh, just a couple of notes. I'd like to do a very quick re reflection and ask a question to Asian Brown. Um, firstly, it's been such an honour really to be here because the Catholic community and the Christian community are here with me and people have been coming up and saying, wow, this is just great. And uh, this is what my life is really about, is the exploration of other past traditions. And Rabbi Cheryl and I, we're actually hoping to host next year the Multi-Faith Interfaith International Conference here in Perth. So we'd love to bring together everybody of every tradition, every faith. And that brings me into our topic, which is resolving conflict with mind mindfulness. Like mindfulness itself is going to be the answer to resolving every problem because it's as we have in our own tradition, we have contemplative prayer um, within all of the traditions there is a deep seeking and an experience of this. Everything that has been said here over these two days are the practices that I do and which many of us do here. Um, but the thing is, without this mindfulness practice, we're still maintaining individual difference. We wear different clothes. We look differently. We practice differently. When I go up to Serpentine with the brothers, I'm conscious of how different I am to them, but I'm very conscious of how similar they are to me. And it's through relationships that I've been able to understand and grow in this. So what I'm asking here and I'm attempting to say in a meditative way, in a mindful way, is we do maintain individual differences and that causes our suffering. We've heard that. But as we move deeply into meditation, we enter into oneness through mindfulness practice or contemplative prayer. But this has a dilemma with it because what happens is we end up moving away from our individual difference. So really, the future of Christianity, the future of Buddhism, the future of Islam, the future of the Jewish community, the future of whatever faith, path and tradition you have could in one sense disappear. And you won't, you, the practice you have will be a practice of mindfulness. Now, my question to our most beautiful teachers here, and especially to Asian Brahm, this question, if we're going to move into mindfulness, Asian Brahm, where will we actually let go of our individual difference? And what could be, perhaps, in our fantasy, the new paradigm of faith that we will enter into or tradition that we'll enter into? Uh, very quickly, before I turn to somebody else, it's just the garden simile. Every flower has a scent. And they never actually, the same like the mindfulness, the prayer, the wisdom, the compassion. That's the scent of the flower. But for goodness sake, let not all the flowers be of the same species. Otherwise, it's back Thank you. Anyone else want to mention something? Oh, good. Okay. So the next question is from um, Jyotika. Hello, this question is addressed to Dr. Gui and maybe all the clinical psychologists. How do you and your members of clinical psychology uh, or mental health practitioners rejuvenate your own self because you face every day suicidal, depression, anxiety patients? Maybe you could share with us um, how do you in your own support group handle your own mental well-being? Thank you for that question. I think this question also pertains to anyone who is caring for someone else who is unwell. 
I think that generally is, is across the board. And the more that I do my work, the more that I find that it's my own Dharma practice that comes forth and helps me. And it comes forth in a few different ways, and I've, I've spoken about this briefly during the panel. Firstly, it gives you the stability of your mind to be able to be present. Because when you're more okay with your own experiences, because we have all of those, we are not that different when you really look at it. Right? Maybe matter of severity and time period. But when we are able to be present to our own inner experiences of turmoil and chaos that comes up, then we're also much more available to others. And the practice allows us that stability of the mind and clarity to be able to be present like that. So more and more so, I find that the practice is what actually comes up and creates that stability for myself and for others. Another, th another point that comes from the more professional angle is that in the clinical setting, we seek supervision. Right? Professionally, we see senior clinicians uh, to get debriefed, to get advice and things like that. And it speaks to this importance of community, which have a few speakers have raised, the sense of Kalyana Mita, the importance of having a community, a support network for each other, because we need each other. The moment a clinician goes into isolation, they practice on their own without much contact with everyone else, that's the start of the ticking point towards burnout. So these are the two key points uh, that I can share from my experience, and probably others will be able to. And that's very good. And for the to move on, because there's many other questions, uh, up the uh, the top there on my left. Thank you. Uh, my name's Joel, and I represent the Dalesford Dharma School. We're a, a Buddhist primary school in Victoria. Um, I've been overwhelmed by uh, a number of Western Australians coming up to me uh, out out the front there, asking about uh, where our school is, and and uh, disappointed that it's not in Perth. <laughs> and uh, I guess my question to you, uh, maybe uh, Arjun Brahm or Arjun Brahmali, about the, the future of Buddhism and uh, where you see Buddhism in education, uh, particularly for young people, children in particular. Very good. I will pass to the buck to Arjun Brahmali. <laughs> 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 because this is an important thing of community, you can always get someone else to do your work for you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think one of the uh, one of the things about one of the problems of having Buddhist children, uh, etc., is that as a child you can't really make a decision about these issues. So, so what a child really needs is a kind of neutral basis on which they can be able to make decisions later in life. Uh, so, a child needs that kind of a broad education to understand uh, uh, general aspects of ethics and morality, uh, and perhaps an introduction to the various spiritual traditions. Uh, yes, we can also teach meditation because as um, uh, brother uh, or oh, Kedwin was just saying just before, uh, these are issues, meditation is something that are accepted across the board in all religions and non-religions alike, atheists or whatever. Uh, but we have to keep it on a secular level for children uh, until they can make a decision for themselves uh, whether they will be Buddhist or not. Uh, but certainly let's use some of the Buddhist insights in a, in a kind of secular fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Dharma, uh, Dharma Ruin, you mentioned in the towards the end of your speech about uh, you asked us is there wrong mind uh, wrong mindfulness as opposed to right mindfulness. Well, I think there is probably wrong mindfulness, but I wondered if you would like to share a bit more about that. Probably not a lot of time to talk about it, but that is you know right wrong mindfulness. Wrong mindfulness. It's up to you. Uh, Buddha very clearly talked about the wrong mindfulness and uh, he says, uh, he gives the example of the uh, the, uh, the shepherd boy who is lying on the grass uh, eating a straw and just being aware of the, he has 50 cattle here and 25 cattle there and that my, mindfulness will never bring him out of wisdom, it will never enlighten him he'll still be the shepherd boy. So what is then the mindfulness? What is the difference? So mindfulness is actually aware, directed awareness. Uh, then you have to direct that awareness or that mindfulness in the right direction. So there comes then right mindfulness. That's why today 
I was few days ago with uh, one of my old friends, uh, a monk, uh, Venerable Nanalu, and he said uh, that there are people today mindful war uh, to learn how to fight and kill. There is mindfulness used for that. So in America, mindfulness is everywhere now. So you have to, as yogis, we have to really uh, find what is right mindfulness. So the wrong, wrong mindfulness is just a directed awareness in the wrong place. So what is that wrong place? Unskillfulness. So what is that? If something comes from greed, hatred and delusion, and if it promotes those things, those are things to let go of. And promote if uh, the opposite of those things arise, that's uh, what you need to this thing. And four foundations of mindfulness, Satra Satipattan is the right mindfulness. Thank you so much. Very good. Okay, we have we have a lady at the top there, please. Off you go. Hello, it's Trish. Um, I'm really grateful for all the wisdom and compassion that there is in this room, both on the stage and in the audience. And I am very aware of how much um, collective delusion there is out there in the world. And we've heard people speak about social justice in Burma and other parts. But there is also a voiceless uh, entities out there, the fish in the oceans, the, the trees, the animals, and all of our planet. And I'm just a slightly disappointed that it hasn't been uh, on the agenda. It's like the elephant in the room for me, that I'm just wondering how high it is the priority for Buddhists to speak out for the voiceless of this world and for our planet. And I'm, I'm really so grateful for the Pope. And I know that there are a growing number of voices in Buddhist circles that are speaking out. But I just thought I would wonder how the panel felt about the priorities. Thank you. Uh, I think I would like to give that to Ajahn Sujata. Thanks. Thanks so much for the uh, uh, the question. Yeah, it's a it's a very good one. And I mean, it's just a conference, okay? So we just have a bunch of topics, and we come here and we try to talk about them and try to keep you entertained for a little while. So it's not like a it's not like it's a, a you know litmus test for what we think is most important. It's just you know we have to pull the, together the conference on one thing. Uh, for myself, I've worked a lot, uh, especially in the area of climate change, and I'm part of a group called the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change. Uh, and uh, please uh, Google that when you get back home. And uh, so the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change has been giving what's very similar to the message which the Pope, Pope Francis gave in this encyclical, uh, except, of course, giving it on an interfaith uh, basis. And uh, we all believe very strongly that, uh, you know, we have this very uh, beautiful planet, this very precious opportunity to, to, to live here, and in all of our different ways, in the different faiths and different religions, we have we have a, an idea that that there is something precious and unique about what this this opportunity that we have. So we also believe, and I think I think personally, I think all all deep Buddhist practitioners, all people who practice Buddhism to any any significant degree, realize that they have some connection with what's going on outside. It's not just about saving yourself. It's not just about doing your meditation, but it's about being part of something bigger. Uh, whether on a communal level, a social level, uh, and also on the environmental level. And we heard yesterday about how the uh, environment was, was, was psychologically soothing us because we're, we're coming back to, to something which we are a part of. Uh, and so for me, uh, this, is, this is absolutely important. Uh, I've, I've written extensively and spoken extensively on this, and, and I've, it's a very uh, important topic. It's also a very uh, distressing one. Uh, and we're seeing more and more people suffering from depression and anxiety because of uh, stress related to the future of climate change. And as I said yesterday in my talk, if, you, if you're not worried about it, you, you're not paying attention. The future is highly uncertain. And in fact, the idea that our civilization is headed for collapse is no longer a, a, a marginal idea. It's no longer something which is just spouted by uh, prophets on the street corner. Okay, it's something which has been said again and again and again and again by all of the world's major scientific institutions. And if we can't pay attention to that and can't listen to that, there's something deeply wrong with us. 
Okay? This is the message. If we keep on living as we have been living, we are headed towards collapse. Simple as that. We're not going to survive. Yeah? So we're going to have to change what we're doing. We're going to have to change it radically, and we're going to have to change it quickly. So for me, this is something which is of great importance, and that's something that we need to address on a spiritual level of how we're going to cope with that. Right? How are we going to live in a world where things are going to be so different? Another question? Okay, please. Time for two more questions, sorry. <laughs> two more questions. Uh, so you've already asked one question, so I have to give it over to this uh, lady over here who hasn't asked a question yet. Hi. Um, I think my question is probably for uh, Ajahn Brahmani um, about the future of Buddhism and um, under, the theme, under the theme whether Buddhist, Buddhism is passive or uh, passionate and Buddhist ethics. Um, my name is Jessica, I come from Hong Kong, and um, last year we had a lot of uh, protests in, in Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of young people went and protested for democracy, for uh, a new set of values, not just based on money and, and things like this. And while this was going on, um, a number of young Buddhists wanted to go and support by just doing meditation sessions during the protest. Um, but we were told by all the people and uh, within the Sanghas that uh, this was a bad thing to do, not because because it was a bad thing to go and uh, and meditate, obviously, but because uh, there were more Buddhist groups in China and that the change would be better done by letting the Dharma into China. Um, and if we were seen as supporting the protesters, then um, it would impede uh, uh, the, the spreading of the Dharma in, in, uh, in China. Uh, and at first I was quite angry about this myself because I thought, well, no, we need, we need to support because that's what I, I truly believe. Uh, but then thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. You know, maybe it's, it's better to sort of go in and, and spread the Dharma from there rather than be seen as saying, no, this is, this is our, uh, our view. So I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you think? What's the best way, uh, of doing this? Thank you. Okay. Gee, that's a good, <laughs> that's a hard question. Uh, but I, I think that uh, I really don't know what the answer is to that one. Uh, and I, I guess it depends on, I mean, I, I'm not all that clued into what's happening between Hong Kong and China, etc. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, sometimes you, sometimes we have to do things. I mean, it, it may be true that, you know, the Dhamma eventually will go to China and it, it will be, I mean, there is a lot of Dhamma in China already, I understand. Uh, uh, and it may actually sprout even more. I think, I suspect that the Chinese authorities are, Fairly, I understand they're fairly keen on Buddhism because it is already part of the Chinese culture to a large extent. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we cannot just think it will be good for the Dhamma in this way and then kind of suppress what is right. If you always suppress what is right to do uh, uh, because it will be good for the Dhamma, you're actually, you end up compromising some of the Dhamma principles that you have. And if we compromise the Dhamma principles, if we compromise the ethics, uh, then there's no point in having that Dhamma teaching in the first place. Because it's important that we live lives of integrity. I don't know in this case whether it really is about compromising the Dhamma or not. This is just a general principle I want to say. So let us, you know, when we practice, we have to practice with integrity. If that means the rest of the world stop listening to us, so be it. The integrity has always has to come first. And only then do we get a healthy Dhamma that we can actually spread around the world. Okay, the last question, unfortunately, coming from the lady at the top. Thank you. I'm very lucky I have the last question. Um, I, I'm a small animal practitioner that um, I see dogs and see dogs and cats almost most of my working time. Um, so I will bring this mindfulness into my workplace and help the animals. So it's not necessary you, you have to have the topic, but you bring this back to what you do every day. So the animal will be benefited. So my, my question is, um, for the consciousness um, and direct to maybe Dr. Bernard or Ajahn Brahm, uh, because all life, well, I think we will die one day, including the animals or any life beings. So with this consciousness, how do we prepare the consciousness to reincarnate to a better place? Um, I mean, like for us, we know how to meditate and have mindfulness and hopefully we will re reincarnate to a better place. But for people who doesn't know about this way and, um, you know, or even animals when unfortunately I have to euthanize most of the sick animals. 
and how do I prepare this consciousness for a better life in the next life? Because I believe they will be reincarnate in their next life. Thank you so much. I have spoken quite a lot, and uh, Rabina sits next to me, Venerable Reader Bina Curtin, wants to answer this question, so please. Just a suggestion. Um, among Tibetan Buddhists, you know, well, it's Buddhist, it seems to me the Buddhist teaching is that whatever we experience through our senses, or the animals as well, leaves an imprint. So you couldn't wish for anything better than to shout the words of the Buddha in the ears of the animals. It, leaves an, it would leave an imprint but when they die, especially if you look at the 12 links. The craving and grasping at the time of death are intensely powerful, and it's the grasping, the number ninth, which activates the second link, which is the, th the karma that throws them into the next life. So as they're dying, make them peaceful, make them calm, make them, you know, don't just kill them, like people think it's so noble, and, and, let, them be, let, and let them hear the words of the Buddha. That could be the imprint, and Buddha will, you know, they'll, they'll go, programmed to go to another decent life, perhaps. Very good. So thank you very much for all those questions, and I do apologize for those uh, of the panel who were not asked questions. Uh, actually, you are the lucky ones, because we got some very deep and uh, difficult questions. And so on behalf of the panel, uh, may I please ask for a round of applause for all the people who presented today. We're standing up in respect for you. Stand on the chairs. On the chairs. Very good. So now apparently we have a couple of more little things which uh, to finish off. So Tracy, if you'd like to take over now. Absolutely. And we'll just keep that round of applause going. Um while the speakers want to, would like to make their way off the stage to maybe, maybe find a more comfortable seat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, while they're making their way off stage, we're going to now uh, mix in a bit of music with mindfulness. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, the Laura Bernay Quintet. Uh, Laura Bernay uh, has made her name a name for herself as a versatile performer. She grew up in uh, the United States on the East Coast in a musical family, uh, learned to sing just about every style of music, jazz, country, folk, blues to classic cabaret and music theatre. Very talented woman indeed. I would like to uh, introduce Laura Bernay Quintet. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and a, quite an unusual gig for us. But, um, you know, and when, when I was asked to play for this conference, I thought, jazz at a Buddhist conference, you know, and I was thinking, hmm, Shouldn't they be having you know, like a shakuhachi player or so, you know, a beautiful Tibetan stringed instrument, something that you could all be meditatingly, you know, floating out on? And then I thought, no, no, that's just wrong view. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's a fixed concept that I've got. And in fact, what could be more, uh, a better example of conflict and resolution than, you know, jazz, actually? And um, indeed, we often hear expressions like, that was music to my ears, you know, when a conflict is resolved. And we often apply musical concepts to communication. And in jazz, players work from a, a central theme, but they take turns leading and supporting in a continuous and an unscripted flow. So there's mindful listening and responding. And uh, it combines structure with spontaneity and, most of all, respect for brilliance and collaborating. And I think all of those things are very representative of, um, of jazz and relationships. So hopefully you'll be hearing a few resolutions today in our music. And I'd like to um, 
go to the next song now, which is by a, a favorite singer of mine when I was growing up by the name of Joni Mitchell. And this is one of her early songs. It's called Song to a Seagull. And um, it's all about the inner conflict that um, we have, all, all of us as human beings, when uh, we're faced with the dilemma of whether to live in this industrialized, modern, techno world or to go and live in the nature and, um, you know, recently I was actually in the far north and I uh, was really looking forward to being separated from any any possible iPhones or emails. And I was quite disappointed to find that we're connected wherever we go. And uh, so I wasn't happy. So there you go. There's a, a good example of, you know, wanting the other thing. But in this song, she says, you know, we can never be as humans completely happy in one or the other. But the seagulls, they don't mind where they are. Fly, silly seabird, no dream can possess you, no voices can blame you for sun on your wings. Oh, before, before the band goes, I'm sorry, just a reminder from Michael down here, um, Laura Bernays Quintet CD is available outside uh, <laughs> and if you want to hear more jazz. <laughs> we cut her off, unfortunately. But, yes, I'd like to invite the president of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, Cecilia Mitra, and she's right behind me. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you, um, Tracy. It's really nice to see everyone here. We have uh, between, oh, almost 900 delegates uh, for the conference, for this conference. It's wonderful. So what was the idea behind the conference? It's time for the Buddhist voice to be heard in Australia. It's time for the Buddhist voice to be heard on current social issues. I wanted to also tell you that we have had immense support from our volunteers. It, the Buddhist Society is the second, uh, well, the Buddhist Society is the largest English-speaking Buddhist group in Australia. We have 4,000 members. And the support we've had for this conference is, is incredible. Everyone uh, wearing the blue t-shirts and everyone wearing the blue lanyards are volunteers. So I, I would really like to thank all our volunteers immensely for this. Instead of giving them flowers, which is so impermanent, we decided to give them an autograph book of Ajahn Brahm. Good, bad, who knows? Angie? Angie probably has a few copies of this, but this is signed. <laughs> Thank you again. And last but not least, the leader is usually forgotten. Please give a round of applause to Cecilia Mitra, President of Buddhist Society, Western Australia. Uh, this is going to be very brief. Um, as you know, that this is the ninth global conference on Buddhism, and I've been to every one of them. And uh, we may know that the venue is usually chosen by a democratic process, which is Angie and I, we work it out together. <laughs> and I'm very glad, after twisting a few arms, to actually announce that the next Global Conference on Buddhism, we haven't got a date yet, will be held in... No! Uganda? Not yet. It's time we brought this global conference 
out of Asia uh, into North America, Toronto. <laughs> so Dr. Pierre Walpola, who I've known for many years, has organized many big talks for me uh, in Toronto. Uh, he has uh, succeeded in uh, submitting to <laughs> my persuasion and also getting his permission from his wife. So it's now absolutely <laughs> there. People know about it. So we'll find a time, maybe two years. It's usually two years or two and a half years. So we'll see you all in Toronto, Canada. Many people, he came all the way from, United, uh, from Toronto. Many people came from all over the world. Bernard came from UK. They've traveled so far to see Perth. Now we can travel to see Toronto. See you there in a short time. Thank you, and please travel safely home. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.